Hello everybody, my name is Gordon Port, I'm one of the volunteers with the Society, the Natural History Society of Northumbria, and uh, today I'm here together with Charlotte Brankin and Rinka Vinkanoog to talk to you about the Northeast Bee Hunt, which is the citizen science project that we have been running throughout this year. So firstly, over to Charlotte, who's going to introduce the project. Thank you, Gordon. So bees are familiar and well-loved insects and the observation and recording of bees in the region has been practiced for quite some time. The earliest bumblebee records um, from the northeast actually come from the notebooks of Albany Hancock back in 1827. Throughout the years, um, collections, accounts and publications by dedicated naturalists have really provided invaluable um, contribution um, to our understanding of bees in the region. And in 2019, the Bumblebees of North East England was published and this reviewed the regional status of bumblebees. Records reveal that some species are more commonplace and widespread, others are scarce, and some have sadly become regionally extinct as well. But gaps do remain in our knowledge of not just bumblebees, but as bees as a group. There are issues of under-recording, and in some parts of the region, there are no bee records at all. So there really is great opportunity to engage more in the northeast to um, study and record bees and to really emphasise that you don't need to be an expert to make a valuable contribution. And this led to the Northeast Bee Hunt, um, which was launched in March of this year. So the bee hunt had three main aims. Firstly, to increase our knowledge of bee distributions in the region with five target species in mind. To also engage more people in the Northeast with bees and with involvement in citizen science. And to also um, trial a pilot um, to form part of a wider citizen science programme led by the society. So five target species were selected for participants to focus on and record and um, these were based on um, their distinctiveness and also that they are able to be found in urban and garden environments which was really important to consider so a greater number of people could get involved. From March through to September of this year participants were encouraged to submit their bee sightings um, on iRecord so with the help of Eric North East, we set up a group activity on iRecord um, that enabled all bee hunt records to be collated and enabled participants to also view each other's records as well. iRecord is an excellent recording program. All bee hunt records were verified by experts on there and the bee hunt records are made available to inform conservation and monitoring efforts. So this includes um, local environmental record centres, county recorders, and they also form a data set on the National Biodiversity Network Atlas as well. So the first two target species were species of bumblebee, the red-tailed bumblebee and the tree bumblebee. The red-tailed bumblebee has this lovely velvety black coat with a red tail and is an underground nester. And they have quite large nests for um, a bumblebee and can contain up to 300 workers. 
The tree bumblebee is another distinctive bumblebee. It has a unique colour pattern compared to um, other species of bumblebee in Britain. And it's quite an interesting species because it was first recorded in Britain in 2001 and reached the region um, in 2007. So it is quite a recent ar arrival. It is also quite unique because it also nests up high in aerial cavities, um, such as bird boxes and roof eaves. And that's because these mimic um, their natural nesting habit of tree holes and tree cavities. The remaining target species are species of solitary bee. So these species are considered um, some of the most distinctive solitary bees you can find in Britain. And they are a good set of species to get to grips with solitary bee ID. So firstly, the red mason bee is an aerial nesting bee. Um, females use mud to line their nests with, which is quite interesting. And the um, Latin name bicornis um, refers to the two facial horns that are found on the female's face. And these facial horns are actually used to manipulate um, wet mud into place when she is constructing her nest burrow. The two other solitary bee species, the tawny mining bee and the ashy mining bee, are species of mining bee. Um, so these bees nest in the ground, typically in bare or um, sparsely vegetated ground. So the tawny mining bee is um, very distinctive. Um, females have a lovely dense foxy coloured coat, um, while the ashy mining bee females are monochrome, um, what I like to call the panzer of the bee world. So again, um, another um, set of distinctive bees to look out for and record. While we did have five target species, we did encourage participants to um, record all of their bee sightings and Rinkin X is going to outline some of the key results. Thanks very much, Charlotte. In the next couple of slides, I will try to give you an overview of the main results of the Northeast Bee Hunts. With every project, with every citizen science project, it's always a bit of a doubt and a risk. Will it work? Will people come to it? Will they take part? And will we get data in? Well, we need not have worried. We got 170 recorders who together clocked up an astonishing nearly two and a half thousand records of bees. In total, we saw 41 confirmed species of bee distributed over 14 genera. So quite a big success with loads of data generated there. Northeast bee hunt. Well, whereabouts in the Northeast did all these bees come from? If you look at the map on the left hand side, indicated are in red boxes the tetras where our observations came from. Quite a few. In total, 15% of the tetras in the region were represented in the Northeast Bee Hunt. That's good. However, it indicates immediately that from 85% of the tetras we did not have observations in. That's important to bear in mind. It doesn't mean there's no bees there, of course. If we then look at the map on the right hand side, it's the same map, but here we indicated the density of records from each tetrad. The more deep and dark the color, the more records we got from there. And now you see there's a distinctive clustering of observations and records. It's the urban areas, Newcastle, Gateshead, Sunderland. It's parts of the Tyne Valley along the coast and Stanhope and surrounding area. That's where quite a lot of the observations came from. Urban areas, not surprising. This was largely done in lockdown and coronavirus situations. People did not venture far from home. And if you look at the habitats where the bees were observed, quite a lot of these habitats were gardens and uh, parks. So within urban, suburban areas. What did the Northeast Bee Hunts add to the overall database that we had already? Well, nearly two and a half thousand records. And if you look at the ERIC database for the Northeast, there are 32 new tetras from which previously we hadn't any bee records at all that are now added to the Northeast ERIC database. So that's quite good. 
And hopefully it looks like we got one completely new species for Eric Northeast. The white-jawed yellow-faced bee, Hylias confusus, first time seen in the Northeast in the database. And here it is, beautiful picture. It's looking quite smug, having just been admitted to the Northeast bee list. 41 species, Northeast bee hunts. Big question, of course, who are these bees? Who are these 41? And who are the main species recorded? So we'll first look at the top 10, and then we'll go one tier down and we'll look at numbers 11, 20 as well. And immediately we hit a bit of a problem. White and buff-tailed bumblebee workers can be quite difficult to distinguish. So in the recording system, there was the option for people to say it was either one of the two. That means we can't be certain for actual number of the buff and the white tail. So in this graph, I pulled them for the two species together over 500 recordings. That means the bee species with the single most observations is the red-tailed bumblebee, followed by the common garden bee, tree bumblebee, and then somewhere around there will sit the white and the buff-tailed as well. Slightly less observations for the early bumblebee and the garden bumblebee. Now, bumblebee is depicted in red here. And what you can see, the first seven species, the first most recorded species in the bee hunt are all bumblebees. Number eight is the honeybee, another eusocial bee. And the solitary bees only start coming at position nine and 10, the red mason bee and the tawny mining bee. Now, number one to 10, all recorded in good numbers, over 100, just under 100. If we then look at the top 20, numbers 11 to 20, we plummet down to under 30 observations. In red, again, the bumblebees. And surprise, we got four more bumblebees there. These four are all cuckoo bumblebees, parasitic bumblebees. The gypsy cuckoo bee, vestal cuckoo bee, the hill cuckoo bee, and the forest cuckoo bee. Now in green, we got mining bees. We already saw the tawny mining bee. But number 13 and 14, we also got the chocolate mining bee and the buffish mining bee. And then later on, the early mining bee as well. If you look at the buffish mining bee, Andrina nigrinia, 21 records for that in the Northeast bee hunt. That doesn't mean to say that it's not an abundant species. Some of these records were made on the specials in the Tyne Valley. Early in the flight season of this bee, we observed buffish mining bee there and estimated their total numbers just on the specials to be over a quarter of a million mining bees. So they can be quite abundant locally. So what does it all mean? Summarize it. Bumblebees are the most recorded species. And locally in the UK, what we call the big seven species of bumblebee, indeed come out as number one to seven in our species list of recorded bees in the Northeast. Then we got further down here, these four species of cuckoo bees, cuckoo bumblebees, parasitic bees, and parasites by their very nature, always are less abundant than our host species. We also got several species of mining bee, and the most recorded solitary bees are the red mason bee and the tawny mining bee. And these two are both part of our target species. So this is a very good point to hand back to Charlotte. Thank you, Rinka. So a key highlight of the bee hunt was that all five target species were observed and recorded. The bee hunt actually received over 800 records of these species and 700 of these records have been checked and accepted by verifiers so far, which is fantastic. The records came from across the region and occupied around 10% of the region's tetrads. The most recorded target bee species was the red-tailed bumblebee, followed by the tree bumblebee and the red mason bee. Of particular note was the amount of new squares that have been generated for these species for the Eric Northeast database, or records that have been generated for these species in squares that haven't been updated in over 30 years. 
So participants of the bee hunt have really increased our knowledge of um, the target bee species distributions in the region by updating squares, increasing the number of records and adding new squares as well. So the target bee species actually represented 35% um, of the overall records received um, during the bee hunt. And as Rinka mentioned, a total of 41 different species were confirmed, and these included 25 solitary bee species and 14 bumblebee species. These bees collectively came from um, 14 different groups, so really highlighting the diversity of bees that can be found on our doorsteps. And also bees that are often more overlooked, including the furrow bees and the um, cuckoo bees and the yellow faced bees. And there are um, species here that are quite specialist in their ecology and also have very few records or known sites in the region. And I'm going to go through six of these species now. So firstly, the hairy-footed flower bee, one of my favourite bee species. It is out early in the year and it's named after the male's hairy legs that he uses during mating. They are quite bumblebee-like bees, um, so they are often misidentified, but their flight behaviour really does give them away. So they are quite zippy and darting in flight, unlike the bumbly nature of bumblebees. And this species has quite an unusual distribution in the region. All of the records are really concentrated around the Anik area. And the bee hunt um, did receive some records further south, um, including Felton, and also a possible record from Morpeth as well. So it is worth looking out for this species, particularly if you have um, lungwort in your garden or cowslips, um, because you never know, they might just turn up. Another um, interesting bee that was observed was the Wolcada bee. Um, this is a bee species that doesn't have many records at all in the region. And it is quite a distinctive bee. Um, it is quite large for a solitary bee and it has yellow spots down its abdomen. It is found flying throughout the summer and they are really fond of woolly plants. And that's because the females use plant hairs and fibres as their um, nesting material. So they are particularly fond of garden plants such as lamb's ear. Males are also fiercely territorial. They will actually defend a patch of flowers and um, fight off any intruders, including other males and um, other insects. And they'll even take on um, bumblebees, which are often double their size. So they really are quite feisty bees. Again, this is a bee that is worth looking out for next year, and um, particularly if you do have lambs here in your garden. The gold-tailed Melitta bee was also recorded during the bee hunt. This is a very specialist bee. Um, it relies solely on bellflower species as its pollen source, um, typically harebell. So good sites of harebell are really important for this species. It was actually only first recorded in the region in 1997, and since then there's only been one favour site for this species discovered in the region. So it is quite an unknown um, bee species in the region. But again, if you come across a good site of harebell um, during July, August time next year, um, do look out for this species because you never know. Another specialist species that was observed during the bee hunt was the bilberry minum bee. So this is a bee specialist on bilberry as a source of pollen. So it is generally found along moorland and heathland edge. This record has quite a nice story behind it because the local naturalist who was involved in the bay hunt um, set about on a mission to find this species in South Northumberland where it hadn't yet been recorded because there's quite suitable habitat there. Um, so he set about a mission um, to find this species. After five hours of searching, he eventually found this bee species and this represented the first record for South Northumberland um, for this species, which is fantastic. 
Another bay species associated with bilberry is the bilberry bumblebee. So this species was observed during the bay hunt from both Northumberland and the North Pennines. As its name suggests, Monte Cola, it is associated with higher altitude habitat, including moorland and heathland. It is locally common and restricted in distribution, and the region does um, have really important populations for this species. So fantastic that this um, bee has been sighted again um, during the bee hunt. And last but not least is the hill or red-tailed cuckoo bee. Um, so this is a bumblebee species that takes over the nests of the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. So it is remarkably similar to its whole species, but it is more dark and sinister in appearance. And it does have these dark smoky winds that really do stand out um, from the red-tailed bumblebee. This species is a regionally scarce species, um, but its range has increased in more recent years. And records are received during the bee hunt um, for this species from all three counties of the region. So a really positive sign that this species is becoming more widespread and common in the region. So now I'll pass on to Gordon, who will go over some of the key participation and engagement highlights. So, of course, we've, we've heard a lot about the bees, but the other important component of the bee hunt were the people who were out doing the recording. Um, I seem to have slipped back a slide, so I'll go back firstly uh, to this one, which shows that there were 170 people in, in total, as uh, has already been mentioned. But you can see that the rate at which records were accumulated and the uh, and way in which people joined into the bee hunt just worked steadily right the way through the season. It really was a, a tremendous effort and these records are, were all submitted at a very steady rate. Um, we weren't giving prizes for how many uh, records people submitted, but uh, there were a lot of people who perhaps just submitted one record um, but then there were a few who did even more than that. There were actually five people who submitted over a hundred records. That's these, these two groups, uh, this group here, sorry. So well done to them, but well done to everybody who took part. Uh, and it's really, uh, as we indicated at the outset, it's, it's far exceeded our expectations as to what was going to happen with the, the bee hunt. So uh, what was the pattern of uh, the number of records and the number of participants through the period of, of the hunt. Well, the numbers of participants remained remarkably steady, uh, slightly dropping off towards the end. And the numbers of records submitted, well, uh, go up and down quite a lot. I'm tempted to try and find out what happened in week 16, why there were so many records submitted, or was it just somebody who sat down for a big session at the computer, putting all their records in? But uh, we had, in that peak, 207 records submitted. Uh, and it was amazing that there was this consistent effort uh, right the way through the period. So quite a lot of participants generated uh, records for quite a long time. So this is the numbers of, of records submitted through the weeks of the, the, the bee hunt. Uh, and the blue bars show you new people joining in and submitting records. So even right up to the end of the bee hunt, there were new participants joining in. And there were two participants who actually submitted records through 22 weeks of the 24. So again, uh, fantastic effort by them. We were expecting to use a whole range of ways of communicating with people. When we set out on the bee hunt, we were planning face-to-face -face events, we had printed material lined up, and we had online material uh, to use. And of course, with the uh, close downs due to the COVID pandemic, we were restricted to really only using communication online. But this has been amazingly effective. The, the web page uh, attracted over 12,000 visits, and uh, we can drill down to show that that was at least four and a half thousand different individuals or households. Presumably people kept coming back to the web page to check on identification and things like that. There were 36 digital articles which had over 11,000 visits. There were videos uh, posted on the website, over 1500 views there. 
And on Facebook and Twitter, we had 24,000 plus interactions, that's likes and uh, repostings and things like that. So the digital uh, um, engagement was fantastic. I have to say it was down to the uh, prodigious effort by one or two people to keep uh, up this. Uh, and there were a few people who were using email as well to keep up to date with the uh, bee hunt and that included 355 non-members so we've gone out beyond the normal membership of the Natural History Society and got more people interested but online was really effective. At the end uh, we ran a feedback survey to find out what people had liked uh, and what, why they were doing it and things like that and 36% of the people who answered the survey were new to wildlife recording. And these are um, bar charts showing you whether people strongly agreed or agreed or neither, or if you go into the gray and the dark brown, they're, they're disagreeing. But most people agreed that the bee hunt helped increase their interest in bees and their knowledge of bees. And I could talk to that myself. I've learned a lot about bees this year. Um, and again, many people felt that their confidence in bee identification was improved. Um, it, it's less clear whether there was a strong feeling about increased confidence in submitting records and increased awareness of biological recording, but I think we've done a, a pretty good job there of engaging uh, with a group of people and, and hopefully enthusing them some more. As a, a lure for the uh, participation in the survey, we offered a prize of Stephen Falk's book, and here is the winner, Neil Pont, uh, who has got this wonderful uh, quote that he's given us, was that he often had to ask for help for identification because he, like many others, is a complete beginner. But uh, the help from people at the Natural History Society uh, meant that he got a lot of his identifications right. And as he says, with this wonderful book, he's got no excuse now. So where are we going to in the future? Um, as we said at the outset, our aims were to increase our knowledge of, of bee distributions, engage more people and to trial a framework for citizen science. And I think you can see that we've been pretty successful at all of those three things. So successful that when we came to close the bee hunt in the autumn, there were whales of protests. And so um, the Northeast Bee Hunt will return. I don't know whether we're going to call it the Northeast Bee Hunt 2. Um, but anyway, it will return next year. And also the Natural History Society are planning a new botanical citizen science project, which is something to watch out for. Now, a lot of what we've said in this presentation is actually going to be summarized in a paper that's going to appear in the next issue of Northumbrian Naturalist. Um, but before we go, a huge thank you to all of those who took part and submitted records. And without you, we couldn't have done this. I think uh, we owe a special thanks to uh, several people. James Common, who, who led on the digital communications. Uh, Paul Stevens, who has been involved throughout in helping plan the bee hunt and produce the maps that we've been showing you in this presentation. And to Claire Freeman, whose uh, ideas really drove uh, the initiation of the bee hunt and, and she kept at us to, to keep on going throughout the duration. So from Charlotte Rinker and myself, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>